Hello and welcome to Manifest. We are the last event of the Digital Writers Festival. And to begin with, I would like to acknowledge the country that we're broadcasting from. We are in the Emerging Writers Festival offices. We are on Wurundjeri country, Kulin Nations land. We acknowledge the that our history is interweave, that these stories have been told on this land for tens of thousands of years. And we pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging and to the elders of the lands that this broadcast reaches. Thank you very much for joining us for Manifest. We wanted to end the festival on a hopeful note. That feels a little bit difficult this week with everything that's going on in the world particularly considering what's happening on Manus Island at the moment, I would urge anyone who is listening to consider emailing and calling your MP. So although trying to envision a future that is good or positive can feel really difficult under the crushing weight of xenophobia, impending climate doom and the consistent narrowing of the stories and perspectives that we have access to through the mainstream media, I think that maybe there's a middle ground between pessimism and optimism. If we're pessimistic and we declare that everything's doomed, why would we act? And if we're optimistic and sure that everything would be fine, why would we act? I defer to Rebecca Solnit, who eloquently quips, it's important to say what hope is not. It's not the belief that everything was, is, or will be fine. The evidence is all around us of tremendous suffering and destruction. The hope I'm interested in is about broad perspectives with specific possibilities, ones that invite or demand that we act. Solnit conceptualizes hope as this middle ground, as a driving force to motivate us to try and envision a future that is livable, that embraces the fact we can't know the future and therefore we may have the power to change it. So searching for some hope in the dark, we have a brilliant lineup of writers for you this evening to close the Digital Writers Festival. First up for you, we have Winnie Dunn. Winnie is a Tongan Australian writer from Mount Druitt. She's a manager and editor at Sweatshop, Western Sydney Literacy Movement. She's also a re recent Bachelor of Arts graduate at Western Sydney University. Her work has been published in VoiceWorks, by the Red Room Company, The Lift of Brow, Sydney Review of Books, and The Big Black Thing. She's performed readings for Sydney Festival, Sydney Writers Festival, Wollongong Writers Festival, and Stella Girls Write Up. And now, here she is for you at the Digital Writers Festival 2017. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Izzy, uh, for that introduction. I'm going to get straight into it um, and thinking about the idea of manifestation and my own culture. Um, Tongans can't talk without bringing the past and present into our discussions about the future. So this is my own way of manifestation. A type of Tongan map. Three Karama Street was my Nana's first house. It was my Gui Fafina's 50th birthday present from her nine children. The whole family watched as Nana touched the front door with her freckly brown melon palms and whispered, Fe ofa aki. Fe ofa aki means to love one another. When I was born, Nana named me after her house so that I would always have a home. The house is in my middle names, Agata Mafileo, Fe ofa aki. Nana thought that the more names you had, the more important you were. Three Karama Street sits just off Woodstock Avenue, which is the main road of Mount Jewett in the suburb of Darik. The house has a red tiled roof and cream fibro walls that make it look like a big pimple. On the front lawn, there are two towering palm trees that look like giant soldiers. And behind the trees, is a high tiled wall with wrought iron gates. When I first saw this, the two-story structure, I had thought it was a castle right in the middle of Mount of Mountie County. Later, my aunt told me that a bunch of Italians built it in the early 60s. Before Nana died, 
she had made three caramel streets as tongan as she could with the front garden, barefoot in op shop button downs, with her afro tied in a wavy bun. Nana planted medicine along the tiled wall. Green aloe vera shaped like lizards, open to heal cuts, grazes, boils and styes. Yellow white nonal fruit shaped like a grub, juice to heal gums and calm indigestion. And green sialid longa leaves, shaped like a beetle's back, crush on the body to rid of evil spirits. Tongans like naming things after Tonga so that our land will carry on our tongues and into the future. Mixed in with these natural remedies were white purple daisies and red roses. They were introduced to Nana by her first husband, Brian. He was English. I remember one Sunday when I was seven, I helped Nana take out the weeds in her apothecary. The sun was making my neck sweaty and the crinkles in the corners of Nana's brown eyes looked like rivers. She tried to teach me all the names of the plants, showing me the gaps in her yellow teeth, her cavities filled with gold. But when I couldn't do it, we sang songs together instead. First, it was a Tongan hymn Nana wrote herself. Faka feta inki asi hova he okunele iya. But after a while, we started singing Elvis Presley. Like a river flows, surely to the sea. Darling, so it goes, some things aren't meant to be. Take my hand, take my whole life too. Elvis was Nana's teen crush. <clears throat> One Saturday, I caught Nana painting on a natto, which is a type of Tongan mat. The light brown material, which matched her skin, was spread all over the front lawn and spilled into the cracked sidewalk. It was a hot day and I didn't get how Nana could sit outside in trackies. She caught me watching, wiped her tree trunk arm across her forehead and called me over. I sat in between her legs silently and watched her paint triangles and circles with thick black ink that smelt like petrol. When I asked her what she was doing, Nana told me that she was painting a diamond shaped pattern which represented food in Tonga called Galau Gubesi. Nana told me that the natto is sacred because, because <clears throat> Nana told me that the natto is sacred because it is how us Tongans create the past, present and future. She told me that the Gubesi will always feed me no matter where I went. Then Nana put the paintbrush between my fingers held my fist in place and dragged the brush over the bark-like material of the natto to make connecting lines. It was the first triangle I ever drew. We painted like that into the early evening until my hand got tired and Nana took over again. I watched one of the neighbours across the street take out her bins, a skippy bogan named Sharon who I once saw kicking one of, my aunt, one of my Nana's street cats who were all named Angel. Sharon walked out in her matching polka dot pajama set with a cigarette dangling from her thin lips. The bins rumbled as she dragged them behind her toward the curb. Sharon's store dyed red hair was tangled and I could see the flab of her stomach over her shorts, which reminded me of a Big Mac bun. After Sharon positioned the bins, she stood on the curb, glaring at us. Her gaze made my palms sweaty and I hid behind my gooey fafine. Only then did Nana realise Sharon was there and waved hello. 
Sharon banged on her bins like a feral dog shrieking. You gonna fucking say sorry for your shit on public property like that? Nana picked, Nana put her paintbrush down, shoved her fist in the air and yelled, the bunny honutu fo ikutu, which meant, shut up, shitty nit. Sharon snarled. This don't belong here now. This here Australia, cunt. I hugged my grandma tightly around the neck while Sharon turned and walked back into her house, scratching her chunky thighs as she did. My gooey fefine bared her gold teeth and kept whispering, Balangi vale, Balangi vale, stupid Balangi, they think they own everything. I never painted the Nato with Nana again. Thank you. Thank you, Winnie. Wonderful. And next for you, we have Jesse Oliver. Uh, something I didn't mention earlier is that all of our readers tonight are from uh, across Australia and, and Jesse is over in Perth and Winnie is up in Sydney. Jesse, who likes feelings anyway? Jesse Oliver does. This emerging trans slam poet also enjoys rapping Shakespeare, practicing his articulation and writing about social justice, aliens and star-crossed love. His work likes to play with what he calls phonetic aesthetics, to break the fourth wall and deliver a casual colloquial style. So far, he's featured at national events, in including National Young Writers Festival and the Emerging Writers Festival. And currently, Jesse holds the title of WA Slam Champion and will be taking on Australia's Best later this year. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so I read a poem um, called Aliens Exist and I think pretty much finished it off two seconds ago but here we go. Um, I looked towards the heavens on a starlit night, my beating heart was open and I was thinking something along the line of, I hope that aliens exist because I took a unit in astrophysics and my teacher told us that civilizations would burn up faster than they could turn up based on which sucks. So if they are up there, then it means that they've learned how to love. It means that there's no place for war or the key from evolving from floor until space and from space until time is the ability to see eye to eye. The only fight is to foster be prosperous. And I don't think that we're lost because yeah, they are up there and they evolved from beings like us who learned how to trust before the universe would welcome them saying, there's a place for you here. Can you imagine? A chariot of stars create a path far, far away. Secrets of life itself, and they say, ah, the prodigal has returned. As back on Earth, we burn the bridges to a dark past. We lift the pavement from the foundations of injustice and let the Earth breathe again. And the world is covered in a warm glow that feels like being spooned by God feeling that they want in the stars, far, far away, where they hopefully will welcome us one day, in party paradise. This is served over the ice rings of Jupiter and the bar tab is endless because we stopped getting stupider and we grew up. But for now, Captain Zing, the, leaning on the bar, he dips his proboscis in a hibiscus drink thinking of its origin. I think I really love these flowers destroy themselves because they've only been there for a few hours. And then the bodiless brain from behind the bar, he flicks on a TV screen above the bar and he points at me. You see, said the brain, they haven't started their journey yet, but at least they know where they want to go. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse. I secretly hope that aliens exist as well. Um, I think there's every likelihood. Next up for you, we have our Melbourne contingent. Kerry Altrade is a Nigerian born writer, spoken word artist, and self proclaimed dance floor extraordinaire, which I can attest to. Having escaped Perth and her past life as a chartered accountant, she's now undertaking a master's in creative writing. 
and on her way to calling Melbourne home. Well, I just claimed her for Melbourne, so. Perry's work centres on identity, belonging, and the journey to self-acceptance in the context of the African-Australian diaspora. Perry has featured at AfroHub, Girls on Key, and for Multicultural Arts Victoria. She's a, she's a 2014 Perth Poetry Slam finalist, co-curator of RMIT's Unlecture series, and has had her work published in Mirrors of Africa. Here's Piri. Thank you. Um, and I'm actually in sunny Queensland at the moment in Coolum Beach, but I do represent Melbourne, so I'm just reading from there today. So, I am manifest. I manifest, manifestation, revelation, confession. I am longing for the truth. I am not her talking out the side of her mouth. I am not crack addict, not sassy sidekick, best friend to white female lead role. I am not the one who dies first in a horror movie, any movie. I am not minor part, slave girl, domestic servant. I am not typecast. I am not stereotype. I am not first of all skin, second, second of all, well after skin and features, nothing else matters. I am matters. I am whole. I am human. I am person. I am no longer a need to remind society of person. I am nuanced. I am detailed. I am particular. I am the shape of my eyes, the contour of my nose, high cheekbones, each unrivaled, strand of 4C coily hair. I am see how each is so unique. I am the one who had to give myself that because the world does not give me that. I am not tribal dancers and being caught in frenzies. I am not heart of darkness. I am not, in, I am not subhuman. I am not Africa as a country. I am not individual people with different looks coming from different countries, with different interests and talents and careers seen as one type of person, as one people. I am not one people. I am undefined. I am unboxed. I am given my innocence back. I am given back the benefit of the doubt, given back my respect, before being shot, before being accused, before being doubted, overlooked, ignored, ridiculed, forgotten. I am not the normalization of internalized racism. I am making you see. I'm telling you, open your eyes. It is long past time for you to open your eyes. I'm not no sir, yes sir, three bags full. I'm not Uncle Tomming, I'm not agreeing. I'm not my skin as some disease, some stain, some sin that I need to wash away. I need to be ashamed of, that I need to be punished for over and over again. I will not be punished for how I look over and over again. I am no longer swallowing bullets. I'm superhero. I am Shiro, I am skin radiation, I am skin radiates, I am skin carries God and more. I am, history has birthed eternity. I am manifest of changing types, of leading, loving mother, student, employee, academic, of superwoman, of love interest, of scuba diver, of dragon fighter, a woman with a life of infinites. I am manifest, I have rejected notions, I have turned them aside, I've crushed them under heel. I've made my own. I've found spaces that make space. I've opened my voice. I've seen my own glory. I am manifest. I will not be a threat for speaking. I will not be threatened for speaking. I am still speaking. I am manifest. I have carried the world. I've survived. I've carried the world when nobody cared about us but us. I am manifest. I am here. I am the page. I am the ink. I am the words and the books. I am thousands and thousands of poems, of songs, of tears, of blood, of sand and dance and seas. I am the stories turned actions. I am those who didn't keep silent, who died for it. I am thanking them for it. I am the ones who inspire. I am the ones who make me feel worth it. I am the ones who make me feel proud, make me look at the mahogany of my hands and love it, feel a warmth on the walls of my stomach and through it. I am the hope that not every dark-skinned girl has to be like me and break and crush and break and hate themselves because of the love that was never taught for it, never meant for it. But I am the words. I am manifest. 
I have made legs, I am running, I'm consuming, I'm consumption, I have come off the page, I've come alive, I'm running, I'm the word made flesh, I am the flesh, I'm unshut, I'm unplugged, I'm the dissolution of walls, you refuse to see past to see me. I am me, I am more than me, I am power, I'm uncontained, I'm revolution, I'm dynamic, I'm currents returning what God gave, I'm fear moving from fingernails down to toes and moving out. I'm speaking while fracturing because someone needs to hear it. I am unapologetic spitfires, I am glass, I'm shards of nightmares, results of violence and violence on two levels and more. I'm writing into the next part. I am the good days, I'm the times that worked, I'm escape and not escape, I'm all the things that happened and all the things that did not. I'm the hope that the sun doesn't always have to set, but it may not always rise either. I am foot forward the unanswered minutes, and the ready to ask questions. I am here, I am here, I am here. So I am, so are we, so have we always been. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. I was just lamenting that um, we've all got our mics muted while we're listening, but there's kind of, there's virtual clicks going on between all of these different folks. Uh, tuning in from across Australia. Next up for you, we have Rebecca Jessen, who is based in Brisbane. She's the award-winning author of verse novel Gap, which came out with University of Queensland Press in 2014. In 2017, she was shortlisted for the Arts Queensland Val Vallis Award for an unpublished poem. Her writing has been published in Overland, Mianjin, Lifted Brow, Going Down Swinging, Cordite Poetry Review, Tincture Journal, and many more. Rebecca is currently writing poems about the queer future and has only recently discovered that she's a cat person. Um, thanks for having me, Digital Writers Festival. Um, I'm going to read some found poems tonight. I think that um, this first one I'm going to read is called Vote Yes and all the text for the poem was found in media clippings about the marriage equality debate. Um, I think any vision of the future is inevitably grounded in our present. Um, I hope in the future this poem will just be an obscene relic of our time. So it's called Vote Yes. We have arrived at the shouting dog stage of the debate. This is precisely the sort of crazed response you'd expect from a dog called Mac. Sport is sport. Let the people go to the football and do who they want to do. Let the people eat their pineapple on pizza. It's un-Australian not to. I mean, for heaven's sake, homegrown heroes are delicate little flowers. The stupid clown in Canberra has a lifelong ambition to headbutt a blizzard of red herrings. Meanwhile, Pauline Hansen claimed, I'm not a sexual person, but now I've got trolls. It's quite strange. I'm really interested in what the mums of Australia have to say about the sordid sex lives of bugs and slugs. Women soften the message, but two mothers cannot fill the vacuum. And I'm tired of them pushing their bagless Dysons in our face. Make no mistake, it's in the bag. It's okay to say no to pineapple on pizza, but the average punter won't care. They've been captured by the juicy fringe of the so-called tropical agenda. While a clutch of conservatives are pumping sewage into a debutante ball on the most sacred day of the year, Mate, it's tantamount to a frenzied zealot wearing speedos. The love of pineapple is not equal, it's a sham. A pineapple is not a pina colada just because it wants to be. So if something like pineapple on pizza disturbs you or makes you fear this whole thing is about something other than a good humoured debate led with un-Australian calm and restraint and list now and 
to conduct a million robocalls and urge somebody to please think of the children. It's all nonsense, of course. There are kids killing themselves in the suburbs while a bunch of straight white men sink tinnies on a Sunday night. But it's a long time, thank God, since gay people have been discriminated against. Um, my second poem tonight is a bit of a space epic. It's set a thousand years in the future. Um, it's a found poem. I got most of a text from the Google Street View of the International Space Station. It was incredibly fun to write. Um, this one's called The Stars Look Very Different Today. In the summer of 3017, Destiny, a queer occupied spacecraft fit with strobe lighting and a giant disco ball, prepares to depart Earth. A habitat teetering on the edge of disaster. The future isn't what it used to be. Russian dawn is delivered by space shuttle. Governments deport non-normative people to orbiting destinations for progress. And pressurized mating is enforced under patriarchal law. If you choose not to comply, you will be ejected to an offshore holding tank, which reclaims unreformed queers. Most will be frozen, refrigerated, or thermostabilized. Many will be dehydrated and heated to serving temperature. An unreformed queer does not require water before consumption. Destiny will be our guide on this mission towards the gravitational nudge of our queer utopia. The enchantingly peaceful limb of our earth waves us off. A perpetual twilight lingers. A plea from the detainees at the offshore holding tank. Please, revolution. After transmitting this haunting evocation of its home planet, destiny speeds on towards the unknown. The one size fits none hemisphere of Earth allows for rapid exit. Destiny tears through the space time continuum and sails into the robotic arms of the man who fell to Earth. This is no temporal drag. Bowie knows all star trails lead directly into the void. A central blue glow scatters in the Martian atmosphere. Blazing comets and unreformed queers are a bewitching sight. The observation is celestial. A zenith viewing window provides spectacular collisions with orbital debris. This is your mission. The boundless frontier of your queer utopia awaits. No longer suspended in the atmosphere, the normative body is a vacuum you can exit by this hatch. There can be no echo of time in the future. Destiny is subject to repetitive squeezing as her sister utopias swing by. We can see the past through tomorrow as destiny ascends into a sky swarming with other stars. But we must never settle. We are not yet queer. We are the warm illumination. We are on the horizon. Thank you. Thanks so much, Beck. Ah, it's interesting how looking forward, often we start by looking up, thinking about the stars. So next, for you, we have Ben Walter. Ben is in Tasmania, and Ben's stories, poems, and essays have appeared in Mianjin, Overland, Island, Southerly, The Lifted Brow, and a range of other journals. He won the 2016 John Shaw Nielsen Poetry Prize, was runner-up in Overland, the U Short Story Prize, and was recently shortlisted in the unpublished manuscript category of the Tasmanian Premier's Literary Prizes for the third time. His most recent book is Conglomerate, 
published as part of the Lost Rocks project. Yes, Ben. Thank you for having me. As the decades have snored and tumbled, restless in this wide bed of landscape, the faults have slowly cracked in your bones. There are gullies wrinkling the skin of your cheeks and your hair is grey grass that's dried and fallen and gone. But your ears are still good and they're bared to the sound of knocking. Bang, bang, bang. A knocking at the cities and towns. A knocking at the doors of the towers of sand baked into concrete and the windows of sand blasted into glass and the sand that props up the foundations of the pale-faced houses, fainting and sick of all that cooped inside, this great balloon we've blown up around us, this great balloon where we are the stale air trapped. And this knocking is not the new storm seething from the sea, or the fires brewing up in the dry pots of valleys, fires boiling over the ranges and foaming down into the scalding suburbs. No, see, you're sitting at a plastic bench in your permarented home and the coffee cup in your palm is chilling faster than you could ever have imagined and you're desperately sipping at that cup to try to catch it up, but there's no catching up. Time is passing slower and the clock on the wall begins to yawn and your heartbeat sounds out the hours like a towered clock. And so there's time for you to watch and listen as this knocking keeps a steady pace with your heart. Bang, bang, bang. And then it starts to hurry till it's no longer marking every hour but every minute and then every second and soon you realize that it's grabbing so often at thunder because it's not one fist knocking it's hundreds it's thousands it's millions of fists knocking at the great inside of your city crashing and insisting and then the first door opens as a green shoot rises up from the middle of your bench and flutters out its fronds. It's just bracken, a rough fern. But then there's another green shoot and another. And there's pencil pine and king billy and orites and hakia and tiny green hood orchids. And this knocking has become a drumbeat of revolution as the inside turns out. An inside out of forest and plain growing up in the city and bursting its balloon. And the paddy melons leap among tables at street side cafes. And the possums scratch at the bark of new trees. And it's not that the city has fallen. The city is not lying in ruins at the feet of this encroaching jungle. A few blocks of brick and a toppled stone head. No. The inside and outside have blended and they lie together. Grasslands in the squares and rivers in the drains and the sky in the sky. And you find that for the first time in years, your old lungs can breathe, your old eyes and your old skin can breathe. And all those creatures and plants that found themselves hanging by a stem as the hot and cold fronts of digging and dozing poured down and hurricaned against them. Here. They've cracked the bitumen and grown up like a plague of native weeds. This is no screen. This is three and four dimensions. And as your clock rubs its eyes and its hands grab back onto normal time, you notice that you've finished your coffee and you get up and without going anywhere, you can walk in and out of your changed room. 
in and out of your transformed home and in and out of your city. And as the green grins around you in so many raw curves, you find that there's space to smile. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And now, last but certainly not least, all the way from ACT, Z Yi Chan. Z is a Malaysian poet based in Ngunnawal country who cooks more than she writes. You can find her work in Peril, Voice Works, Australian Poetry, amongst others. Here's Z. Hi. Um, so I'm going to be reading two poems tonight. Um, when I was thinking about this theme, I found it really difficult to be hopeful. Um, <laughs> so I don't think my poems came out really hopeful after all, but if I had a message um, about an unknowable future is that, I don't know, the only thing that's certain is yourself. Um, so I think in my poems, I'm just trying to reconcile my identity and um, my thoughts. Um, so here's my first poem, it's called Let Me Be Survived by Loneliness. One, give two names to a stretch of space, proximity and distance. My body conveys the difference between loved and lonely by her approximation to blood, proximity or distance. Two, in a dream displays reams of staircases to outer space. Under each step, its riser, open staircase be framed for stars, me on narrow step, leading descent. Of an uncle, a brother, a cousin, my mother. How does anyone summon anything remotely close to courage or will? To execute even mindless routine when breathing becomes an impossibility. I think about how easy it is to put one foot out and let gravity take me to the next step, the landing, the next set. I know, I know, what is gravity in outer space? And what is home where there is exile? This here is a dream, this is post something or another, this bears no consequence. I want nothing to have me, including gravity. Three, where does this lead us? I contemplate the stacks and stacks of stairs under me without the punctuation of floors. Think of hell, all 18 levels. Think of levels, chung, oddly, body, shi, dead, above cloud. Where does this leave us? Four. When I wake, I set about cutting and bruising anything that bleeds tears, cook everything that stings, begin eating a meal that will satiate my hunger before it does my nostalgia, put away the leftovers, call Ma. Five. Ma, I'm wanting, I'm wanting to go home. Let home be as simple as proximity to you. Home need not be Swatow. And because this poem is for a white audience, let me clarify, Swatow is a city in Guangzhou where generations ago my family was from, before Australia, before Malaysia. And generations before Swatow, we must have been from elsewhere, but my longing for this specific city stems from a fantasy that no one in Swat, however, asked our ancestors, where are you from? Ma, can I come home? The only indigeneity I recognize is to you. Six, when did whites arrive on the shores of time? She too has been colonized. Expel whites from spine, let it be ash. Seven, nothing I ever write has anything to do with hope. Convince myself, despite my location, my ancestors, all their trades, their tongues, their gods and their ghosts be my legacy. Remind myself, 
I am many. Pray this lonely survives me. Thank you. Um, so the second poem I'm going to read is, um, it's born mostly of frustration and um, I guess in the vein of backing yourself. Um, yeah, it has a title, but the, I think the title has little to nothing to do with the poem. But so with that in mind, this is, um, I enjoy being infinitely beautiful and I'm shook at my capacity to do so. Identify as migrant, as Malaysian, as woman, in no particular order, which is to say I am between places, which is to say I am lost in multiplicity and lonely as multiplicity. I identify as poet, which is to say I web emotions and moments in the spit that is English. There's grief to express, but I would rather spread agave of the lips and seal. I would love to be said loudly, but to do so will require too much English. Trim back this language and keep sadness in spaces where quiet is. This sadness, product of colonialism and colonized emotion today. This I wish to keep sovereignty over, so let breathe, let be, let this quiet be enough of a visibility. The thought need not be full to be real, a language need not be whole to be real. Let this in cutting English every which way hurt this language that has ate its fill of my mother other tongues. Take all the time in the world to name my feelings only to produce more dark namelessness. In which time I start writing food into poems. Have all my poems read like recipes. Whatever I write may make no sense to anyone, but who the fuck do I write for, live for anyway? Thank you. Thank you. And that marks the end of manifest, but hopefully not the end of hoping and manifesting a future. <laughs> um, thank you to all our wonderful writers today, tuning in from all across Australia. Um, we're giving a big virtual round of applause. Um, and this event also closes the 2017 Digital Writers Festival. Um, so to catch up on anything that you missed, head to 2017.digitalwritersfestival.com. Uh, if you want to find out any more about these phenomenal writers, their Twitters and their websites are all also linked from the website. A big shout out as well to Hiroki Kobayashi, our program producer who put this event together, who brought together all of these phenomenal writers from across Australia. Uh, he's here in the office, hiding over there, doing the tech. Thank you, Hiroki, and thank you again for joining us.